Yeah, C.C. Beck, and the one story that he wrote back in the old days, The Temple of Itzalatahui. Um, we're going to refer back to The Temple of Itzalatahui. But let's get to what's in the book here. The book starts, as I've shown you several times, with issue number 19. A lot of these early Captain Marvel comics, oh, these early Shazam comics, had... Um, Oh, sorry, I just got distracted by what somebody wrote there. Jimmy Peoples, I read your shirt backwards and thought it was a new Muslim superhero. Oh, jeez. Okay. Um, right, because this is Facebook Live, this is in Mirror Image. When I put this on YouTube, on the Captain Marvel Culture YouTube channel, um, I'm going to reverse it. Um, so where was I? Yeah, so there were reprints of Fawcett stories in a lot of the early Shazam comics. So the original stories didn't take up a whole issue for many of them. Uh, in any event, that was the way it was in issue number 19. This story by Elliot S. Magan, drawn by Kurt Schaffenberger, edited by Julius Schwartz, is um, Who Stole Billy Batson's Thunder? Now, one interesting thing you'll notice here is that Captain Marvel and his adversary have reverse colors like reverse flash. What this... The villain in this story is Zazo, who is sort of like uh, a Mr. Mixipletic character, that, that imp from the fifth dimension or whatever, um, who is always bothering Superman. Well, this imp is bothering Captain Marvel uh, and has figured out how to wear that helmet to steal Captain Marvel's lightning to turn himself into a Captain Marvel type character. Now, let's just look at Billy Batson there for a moment. They had explained the 20 year gap between 1953 and 1973 of appearances by Captain Marvel through, uh, he and all his friends had been trapped in a globe of suspendium by Dr. Savannah and through some accident, Dr. Savannah and his family, Savannah Jr. and Georgia Savannah. That's right, Georgia Savannah. Anyway. Um, were stuck in suspendium for 20 years, then they got close to the sun, the suspendium melted, they all came back in 1973, and for the first couple of issues there were fish out of water stories, but then Billy Batson and Mary and everybody else got with the program, got with the modern world, and you'll notice Billy Batson wearing bell bottoms. Check those, check those flares out. Also, note the sweater. Note that the sweater has a cuff, uh, a trim at the bottom. If you go back to the original comics, you'll see that when C.C. Beck was drawing them, Billy Batson's sweater was tucked in, tucked into the pants that's in here somewhere. Yeah, see? Sweater tucked into pants. So, that's one obvious change right there. Um, also, you'll see, as the stories go on, Billy's hair gets longer, uh, fuller, bigger, because it is, after all, the 1970s. Anywho, so with this, we can see that uh, we can see the Kurt Schaffenberger art here. Note, every line is closed. There is no scritchy scratchiness. Even the feathering in the shadows and folding of clothing is very deliberate, very polished. Um, that was the hallmark of... Kurt Schaffenberger's art. And look, there's, like I was saying, a beautiful, iconic picture. Only the smallest corner of the cape is clipped off by the frame. Um, so, yeah, Zazo turns out to come from another dimension. And, no, this is not the first time uh, that a spanking has occurred in a Captain Marvel comic. Yes, yeah, Zazo turns out to be a petulant child, much like the uh, the adversary of many a Star Trek episode. Now, the next story in the book is a Mary Marvel story drawn by Bob Oxner. Now, Bob Oxner did draw a few Captain Marvel stories in these Shazam comics. There was some overlap between uh, C.C. Beck and Kurt Schaffenberger and Bob Oxner stories, but one disappointing thing about these two editions of uh, these reprints is in the back, they have bios of artists and writers here. And here they have Bridwell, Conway, Magan, O'Neill, Schaffenberger, Giordano, Vince Coletta, and Rich Buckler. But in neither of these books do they have a bio 
of Bob Oxner, which is a shame because not, no, not only did he do good work, he did a lot of work. Now, Oxner is, uh, among other things, famous for drawing romance comics, and he really knew how to make pretty girls. And uh, there is no denying that his Mary Batson and Mary Marvel are among the, the prettiest versions of these characters ever drawn. Part of, uh, part of the appeal, part of what works on this, I'm going to show you a comparison to uh, 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 Schaffenberger in just a moment. Uh, by the way, uh, Uncle Marvel is part of the story too. Uncle Marvel was a fraud who pretended that he was Mary, uh, Mary Marvel's uncle. Um, and he was a quick change artist and a, and a uh, sleight of hand artist, a stage magician. And so when uh, Mary Batson would say Shazam, or any of the Marvels would say Shazam in his presence, and he wanted to be a Marvel with them, he would do a quick change during the lightning flash and say, look, here I am. And then when it was like, uh, okay, then let's fly to the scene, he would be like, uh, you mind if you just help me out here? I've got my little Shazam Bago acting up. So, uh, uh, and turned out that he was a really good guy and they liked having him around and he actually helped them and he was a useful person, a clever person. So they all pretended that they believed him, even though they knew he was a fraud. But anywho, so, uh, uh, like, for instance, in this story, um, Uncle, Uncle Marvel has a TV show, but he gets kidnapped by this guy in a mask. Ah, the guy in the mask wants Uncle Marvel to use his powers to help him commit crimes because he doesn't know that Uncle Marvel really isn't uh, powerful. And he, but then he thinks fast, says, just let me do my TV show. And so when Mary's watching the TV show, he stresses certain words. Mary figures out that he's writing a code, and that's how he figures out, how she figures out how to solve the case. Now, um... Now, of course, one of the running one of the running things about uh, Captain Marvel, one of the few weaknesses of the Marvels is that is that their alter egos are human, and they can get sick and die and be killed just like anyone. Even though, but as heroes, you know the Captain Marvel, Mary Marvel, they're completely invulnerable to harm, so as well as being strong and wise and fast and all that. So, a running gag is that when they are in their human forms, they get captured, bound, and gagged. So, and how do you get that gag off? In this case, she moved her head so as to catch the, uh, get the gag caught on the sword, says the magic word, and saves the day. All right. Now, the very next story uh, in the next issue was actually a complete uh, story in the issue, and this was the first is I either the first or second issue of Shazam that I ever bought that I ever got when I was a young child when I was a young child I asked my mom who was your favorite superhero growing up and she said Captain Marvel and it just so happened there was a Captain Marvel comic on this on the newsstand and so she bought it for me and I'm pretty sure this was actually the second one the first one was a hundred page epic that had a lot of uh, reprints from, from the Fawcett days, and the theme was the seven deadly enemies of man who are the statues on the side of the cavern that is the hallway to the wizard Shazam, and, uh, and they're loosely based on the seven deadly sins, only with a couple of them switched out for, for, you know, other names. Anywho, uh, anyway, so, this story, however, was possibly the greatest standalone single issue story in the entire run of DC's Shazam. Um, as you can see, it's got the full Marvel family there, each fighting each member fighting their own villain. And uh, it's, the title is "The Strange and Terrible Disappearance of Maxwell Zodiac." Uh, the story is actually pretty simple when you break it down. Um, this old lady shows up at the station WHIZ office where Billy Batson works, says that this guy had disappeared in a lightning bolt a long time ago. Um, I'm not exactly sure why she all of a sudden shows up uh, on the, uh, uh, why she waited so long, but she had found in his room these maps, 
and so the Marvel family decides to go off and find them by following the maps. And so each of them, in the tradition of the Fawcett comics, when the Marvel family, uh, in most of the Marvel family stories that I've seen, the three members each go off on their own separate adventure and then they come back together. So here they do. Captain Marvel Jr. goes and fights with a dragon. Now, I want to show you some... We get to really analyze some of the brilliance of Kurt Schaffenberger here. First off, uh, check out how we've got some perspective here. We've got the bigger feet in the foreground and the head smaller in the background. But on top of that, this foot pops out of the frame there. So thereby giving an illusion of 3D right there. And this dragon's such an adorable little thing, though. You kind of feel bad for him that he got beat up by Captain Marvel Jr. Um, and uh, there's Maxwell Zodiac, and he actually exhibits a bit of fondness for this dragon named Arson, of course. And look, there again, he's got the tail just dipping over the frame, uh, the scales uh, uh, popping above the frame, even the little teeth dipping over the frame there. That's so adorable. And then... <clears throat> Maxwell Zodiac lights up the flame again. <clears throat> Look at how happy. Look at how happy that dragon is. Isn't that adorable? Schaffenberger had a way of making things adorable. What can I say? <clears throat> okay, now, here is Mary Marvel. Yeah, she's cute and she's pretty and all, but what is the magic of Bob Oxner that makes her a little cuter and a little prettier? I'll tell you what. <clears throat> Depth, thickness of line. All right, look here. In um, Bob Oxner, not having to restrain himself to C.C. Beck or Schaffenberger style when doing a Mary Marvel story, because in the original comics, Mary Marvel was not drawn in strictly the Beck style. She was drawn with a little bit more uh, realism with regards to details and shading and wrinkles of clothing and that that sort of thing, although also with a little bit of comedic exaggeration in the poses. Notice the top lip is a solid line. All right, uh, there's a few other ex is is a solid shape, whereas the bottom lip is open so that it can be colored. There's something about that. Also, putting that little shadow there for the nostril. There's just something about that putting that little dimple in for the smile. There's just something about that. Um, there's something about making the roundness of the mouth when she is uh, expressing uh, consternation or something. There's a, uh, look, look at that. Uh, the thinner upper lip, the dimple on the side there, um, that shape of the face, the, uh, the shadow of the hair, all those things kind of just add a little something to the beauty, to the attractiveness, to the uh, even neotenousness, neoteny of the face that somehow Schaffenberger's fine line doesn't quite capture. That's just my opinion and why Bob Oxner's girls are ever so slightly prettier than Schaffenberger's. But moving right along... Um, they, uh, each character, each hero, Captain Marvel Jr., Captain Marvel, and Mary Marvel, have their respective adventures. They find Maxwell Zodiac. Maxwell Zodiac, well, they each find one of three Maxwell Zodiacs. They're brought to, they come together. It turns out that Maxwell Zodiac had figured out how to separate himself into three people so that he could become a superior human. The world freaks out. There's a Schaffenberger crowd. Schaffenberger was great at drawing crowds. And uh, so he, so uh, Maxwell Zodiac understands that people just ain't gonna, just are gonna be scared. And besides which, his interests are no longer human interests. So he takes off. And uh, Captain Marvel, being the grown up of the bunch, you see, uh, Captain Marvel was actually a grown-up. He was a different consciousness, a different personality from Billy Batson in the original concept of the character. Um, Mary Marvel and Captain Marvel Jr. may or may not have been different concepts, but uh, consciousnesses, but uh, personalities, 
But Captain Marvel was a grown man while Billy Batson was a young boy. So Captain Marvel would have the maturity of a grown man, where Billy Batson, though he was very mature for his age, was not a grown man. So while Captain Marvel Jr. is trying to chase after him and uh, Mary Marvel is looking all sad and stuff, it takes Captain Marvel to have not just the wisdom of Solomon, but the maturity of a grown man to say it's his destiny to go into the universe and learn what Earthmen may not learn for centuries, things beyond the understanding of even the Marvel family. We won't try to follow him. We'll just wish him good luck and pleasant journey. That story was written by Elliot S. with an exclamation point, Magan. The f um, and that was the last of the Shazam stories that he would write, and it's a damn fine one to go out on. Now, the next few issues of Shazam were uh, reprint issues. And so you had these covers, original covers drawn by Schaffenberger, of uh, relating to the stories that were inside. Um, this one was drawn by Ernie Chua, I believe, uh, later to reveal his name to be Ernie Chan. Um, but they were not original. That's three issues with not original stories. Now, this one, all right, this is a big deal issue. Now, there was this TV show called Shazam. And yes, it was based on the comic book. Uh, so those of you who say that there is, there is or was a conspiracy by DC Comics to snap up the character and bury him, excuse me, he got his own fucking comic book, all right? He got every kind of merchandising item that Superman or Batman or Wonder Woman had, Captain Marvel had from DC. T-shirts, board games, matchbox cars, and he had one thing that none of those three characters had, and that was a live-action Saturday morning TV show uh, starring Jackson Bostwick as the hero until uh, he pissed off the producers and they fired him and he went to court over it and won, but he didn't get his job back. John Davey took over after that. And Billy Batson was played by uh, Michael Gray, who had been, uh, who was a teen idol at the time, even though he was 23. Um, and it was a story about um, the the TV series was Billy Batson driving around in this camper in an RV with his mentor. Um, and they would make references to him working at a TV station. A mentor would make oblique references that made it sound like he'd been... You could pretend that he was immortal because he talks about learning how to shoot, arch, shoot arrows from Apollo himself. You know, stuff like that. But it was different enough from the TV series that it was different that you had to be one of those people who could accept that the TV show isn't going to be exactly like the TV series in order to enjoy it. But after a year or so of the TV series, DC decided, uh, well, um, the network, I'm not exactly sure if it was the network or Filmation, the makers of the TV series, came up with the idea, I'll look into it and get back to you later on that, of having a companion show and somebody came up with the idea of having the Egyptian goddess Isis being a female Captain Marvel type hero in that a human person would say a magic word or phrase and transform into this ancient goddess. And therefore, the Shazam Isis Hour became the marketing key for a new line of comics in DC called the DC TV Comics. Well, Shazam already existed as a DC comic, they just gave it the DC TV label. They also started an ISIS comic, DC TV, and believe it or not, Welcome Back Cotter as a DC TV comic. It only lasted a few months, I think, not even a full year. But in the uh, showcase edition of the Shazam series that was put out, the story that this cover is referencing was not printed, possibly because that version of the goddess Isis, trademarked at, and copyrighted presumably as 
mighty Isis, and with that specific costume and that specific look, it was a property of Filmation, the TV studio, not DC Comics. So uh, that's my presumption on why that story has never been reprinted. However, here, presto bango, it's reprinted.